Peace be with you. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Jesus via Mary. The best, surest, and the quickest way to the sacred heart of Jesus is through his mother, the Blessed Virgin, the Immaculate Conception. She's our mother, too. Mary, our mother. Let's begin with a prayer. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that any one who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, we fly unto you, O Virgin of Virgins, our Mother. To you do we come, before you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, Despise not my petitions, but in your mercy, hear and answer them. Amen. Well, here we are, brothers and sisters, 2014, and it's Holy Thursday. Tonight we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Tomorrow, Good Friday, we celebrate and honor the Passion of our Lord. And on Easter Sunday, we honor His Resurrection. We must remember that St. Paul said that if Christ be not risen, our faith is in vain. But he is risen, and it's a very glorious day. Let's talk a little bit about Easter Sunday. But before I start doing that, I want to mention that the following week, April 27th this year, is Divine Mercy Sunday, which also is a very special day, especially this year because Blessed Pope John Paul II and Pope John XXIII are both going to be canonized saints on that day. And this is the Sunday following Easter, which is called Divine Mercy Sunday, and it's the day within the octave of Easter. Next week we'll be talking a lot more about Divine Mercy, the image, the devotion, the novena, and most especially on Divine Mercy Sunday, Anyone who receives Holy Communion in the state of grace, having gone to confession, all of their sins are forgiven, and all of the punishment due to sin is forgiven. And this is a promise directly from Jesus Christ, given to Sister Faustina, who is now Saint Faustina, back in the 1930s. We'll talk more about that much more next week. But in the meantime, we're here. We're ready for Easter. This is the most excellent day, the happiest day in the whole year, because it is the day when Christ, our Paschal Lamb, has been sacrificed. Now, Christmas, too, is a joyous feast, but whereas Christmas vibrates with a note of sweetness, the Paschal Solemnity resounds with an unmistakable note of triumph. It's joy for the triumph of Christ. St. Paul, in his words, said, Let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The Paschal joy is solidly grounded on the knowledge that we are in the truth, the truth which Christ brought to the world and which he confirmed by his resurrection. The resurrection tells us that our faith is not in vain, that our hope is not unfounded, because it isn't founded on a dead man, but on a living one, the living one par excellence, whose life is so strong that it vivifies in time as in eternity all those who believe in him. These are his words from John 11. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, although he be dead, shall live. Joy is truth, for only sincere and upright souls who seek the truth lovingly, and still more do the truth, live the truth, can fully rejoice in the resurrection. We are sincere when we recognize ourselves 
for what we are with all of our faults and deficiencies and our need, our constant need for conversion day in and day out. From this knowledge of our miseries springs the sincere resolve to purify ourselves of the old leaven of the passions in order to be renewed completely in the risen Christ. The Gospel of Mark places before our eyes the faithful holy women who at the first rays of the Sunday dawn ran to the holy sepulchre and on the way wonder to themselves who will roll back the stone from the door of the sepulchre for us. Let's back up just a little bit. And the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we have remembered that the seducer, that means Jesus, that he said, while he was yet alive, After three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, the sepulchre to be guarded until the third day, lest perhaps his disciples come and steal him away, and say to the people, He is risen from the dead, and the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard, go guard it as you know how. And they, departing, made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting guards. And in the end of the Sabbath, when it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and coming rolled back the stone and sat upon it. And his countenance was as lightning, and his raiment as snow. And for fear of him the guards were struck with terror, and became as dead men. And the angel answering said to the women, Fear not, for I know that you see seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come and see the place where the Lord was laid. And going quickly, tell ye his disciples that he is risen. And behold, he will go before you into Galilee. There you shall see him. Lo, I have foretold it to you. And they went out quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy, running to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them, saying, all hail! But they came up and took hold of his feet and adored him. Then Jesus said to them, Fear not. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee. There they shall see me. So that was the beginning of Easter morning. You may remember, brothers and sisters, the story of the two disciples who were on their way to Emmaus. I'd like to share with you some thoughts on that, uh, written by Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. Only he, the living one, can give meaning to existence and enable those who are weary and sad, downhearted and drained of hope to continue on their journey. This was the experience of the two disciples who were on their way from Jerusalem to Emmaus on Easter Day. They were talking about Jesus, but their sad looks expressed their disappointed hopes, their uncertainty and melancholy. They had left their homeland to follow Jesus with his friends and had discovered a new reality in which forgiveness and love were no longer only words, but had a tangible effect on life. Jesus of Nazareth had made all things new. He had transformed their life. But now he was dead, and it seemed to be all over. The presence of Jesus, first with the words, and then with the act of breaking the bread later on, enabled the disciples to recognize him, and they could feel in a new way what they had felt 
while they were walking beside him. Their quote, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? This episode points out to us two special places where we can encounter the risen one who transforms our life. In listening to his word, in communion with Christ, and in the breaking of the bread. Two places profoundly united with each other because word and Eucharist are so deeply bound together that we cannot understand one without the other. The Word of God sacramentally takes flesh in the event of the Eucharist. May the Easter season be for us, for all of us, a favorable opportunity to rediscover the source and sources of faith, the presence of the Risen One among us with joy, recognize it with joy and with enthusiasm. May we allow ourselves to encounter the risen Jesus. He, alive and true, is ever present in our midst. He walks with us to guide our life, to open our eyes. Let us trust in the risen one, who has the power to give life, to make us be born anew as children of God, capable of believing and of loving. Faith in him transforms our life. It frees us from fear, gives it firm hope, enlivens it with God's love, which gives full meaning to existence. Here's another thought from a father, John Toller, who lived in the 14th century. He was a Dominican priest, and this too has to do with the two disciples on the way to Emmaus. One of these two disciples of our Lord was named Cleophas, and the other, as some think, was St. Luke, the evangelist, who tells us of this apparition of our Lord on the evening of the resurrection. Their eyes were held as the Lord appeared to them, and he was disguised as a pilgrim. They did not recognize him at first. St. Gregory says that he appeared to them because they loved him, and that yet he concealed who he was because they were still doubtful about his resurrection. Therefore he upbraided them for their incredulity and hardness of heart and their want of understanding. And he opened to them the hidden meaning of the scriptures. Their faith was mingled with doubt, and yet they had been speaking affectionately about him. And when he joined in their conversation, his words made their hearts burn within them. St. Dionysius tells us that love has five degrees. The first degree is the active one, and is less closely joined to God than the others. In this degree, the soul begins to turn to God and to cherish him with a kind of anxious love. It practices certain devout exercises very earnestly. It's afraid that it will cool in its ardor and would seek its beloved and ever follow him. Its voice is that of the bride. In my bed by night I sought him whom my soul loves. That's from the Canticles. But the bridegroom finds this couch of active love too narrow and this state is not according to his will. But the soul does not give him up. On the contrary, it seeks to possess him with much distress of mind. The two disciples who journeyed toward Emmaus had this sort of love, meanwhile conversing about their beloved master with afflicted hearts. You may recall, brothers and sisters, that several weeks ago, we read you some meditations for the Holy Rosary that were given by Blessed Mother to a mystic. And they were in Blessed Mother's own words, and they recalled her thoughts 
at the time of the particular occasion. I'd like to share with you now thoughts that Mary had regarding the resurrection of the Lord. I felt deep within my soul that my son would rise from the dead. Yet on that first Easter Sunday I was still steeped in the miseries of Good Friday and my heart ached for his presence. We set out for the tomb early as the sun was rising. Some carried oils hoping to better preserve his body as he had been prepared for burial with great haste on the previous Friday. My companions moved past me as we were passing Golgotha. I paused at the spot marked by the cross he had been taken from. There was an empty hole to mark the place where it once stood. Nothing more. My heart burned inside of me. So much did I long to see him. I was deep in prayer when a hand reached out to me. It was his hand, wounded by his enemies. His face shone in heavenly brilliance. He smiled as my tears filled his wounds. He said, Victory is ours. He remained but a few more moments. I understood he yet had a mission to fulfill. He vanished as quickly as he came. My heart was gladdened as I proceeded on my way to the tomb, filled with the joy of the resurrection. All praise to the living and true God. All praise to Jesus Christ. Alleluia. Have you ever wondered, brothers and sisters, what our Lord Jesus Christ was doing between the time when he died on the cross and then was subsequently put into the sepulcher, his body was. Between that time and when he rose on, rose from the dead on Easter morning, his soul was very busy. Yes, his body was in the sepulcher. It was dormant. But his soul was very, very busy. I'm going to read you just the first part of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. I'm going to stop there. Yes, our Lord descended into hell, but not the hell that you and I are so afraid of and we don't want any parts of actually he ascended into limbo and that's where everyone who had died in a righteous holy manner was being held until the day when Jesus by saving us brought them from limbo into paradise let's consider some of these meditations here which will help to clarify that. The glorified soul of Christ is in limbo among the elect of the old dispensation. The presence of Jesus puts an end to their long dark advent. Jesus reveals himself to them and converses with them. He transforms their prison into a paradise. Like the Most Holy Eucharist enclosed in the tabernacle, the body of Jesus lies silent and motionless in the sepulchre. Sixteen soldiers keep watch. The eyes of all the world are turned toward his grave. And suddenly as flint when struck emits fire, so at the first touch of dawn in the east, on Easter morning, Jesus rises glorious from the grave. Therefore, the divine prince begins a new life, which will know no end. He begins a new day, which will never wane. 
Jesus is animate with the fullness of divine joy. His difficult task has been accomplished. He has gained the victory over death, and he has freed us from sin and from hell. I want to stop there just for a moment. We have to cooperate with his grace, because remember that God once said, I created you without you, but I will not save you without you. Continuing in the meditation. As at death the soul of Jesus was an abyss of tribulation, so now it is in the wellspring of divine blessedness. So shortly before he was the prey of all manner of tribulation. Now he is inebriated with a fullness of joy. A short time before he was loaded with reproach and continually insulted. Now he is resplendent with power and glory. The body of Jesus, lately all covered with wounds, is now exceedingly beautiful and wondrously glorified. The five wounds are more radiant than precious stones. Like a bolt of lightning from the sky, an angel descends from heaven and rolls back the stone of the tomb. The soldiers lie prostrate, as if dead from fear. Then rising up, they flee into the city. They are the first to proclaim the Easter message. He is risen. After his resurrection, Jesus must surely have appeared first to all his holy mother. He embraces her and presses her to his divine heart. He changes the bitter sea of her tribulation into an abyss of indescribable joy. The glorified Savior appears also to Peter and to the other apostles, to the disciples of Emmaus, and indeed to several hundred others. During forty days, he converses with them of the kingdom of God and inspires them with faith and joy and courage. As for me, I will arise from the grave of my sins and wicked habits. Then, like Jesus, I shall arise from the dead on the last day, and my body and soul will be transfigured like his. In like manner, the marks of my sufferings in soul and body will be glorious tokens of my reward. No suffering will have been in vain. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to share with you now some meditations on the Passion from St. Paul of the Cross. He lived in the very early part of the 18th century, and he was the founder of the Passionist Fathers. And although he's not well known today, he was a great mystic. This is a thought for Palm Sunday. Give your trials lovingly to God and pray in this way. Yes, Father, such has been your gracious will. Father, not my will, but yours be done. This was the prayer of Jesus Christ. When you have prayed this way, be quiet and fear nothing. Pray the Passion. I dearly desire that the object of your prayer should be the passion of Jesus Christ, in loving dialogue with him. But understand me well, I want to leave you free to follow the loving attractions of the Holy Spirit. We must not pray in our way, but in God's way. Accompany Jesus in the passion. Live entirely fired with passion by the love of Jesus. Let your delights be his most holy wounds. Keep him company in the garden. O oh, tears of Jesus, carry them in the bosom of your soul with great love and sorrow. Dialogue with the Suffering Jesus Keep the sufferings of Jesus deep in your soul. Bring them to life with a sorrowful and loving memory such as, O oh, dear Jesus, how I see your bruised and swollen face. 
O oh, my love, how I admire all these wounds. The Eucharist, the Fountain of Love I am sending you a precious book which treats of frequent communion. I desire that souls come to know God and burn with His love. I don't know any other road to this than to bring them often to experience the Eucharist, which is the living fountain of holy love. Dying with Jesus When you are experiencing an agony of suffering in your spirit, cry out as Jesus did on the cross, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In this way you will please our wonderful Father. Your agony will end and you will die a mystical death to rise in Christ Jesus to a perfect life of love. With Jesus and Mary in suffering. I pray to a merciful God to console you in the great trials you are presently experiencing. However, don't stop placing them all in the most holy wounds of Jesus. This will ease them for you. Also place them under the mantle of Mary's sorrows. She will bathe and soothe your heart with tears. Jesus is risen. May our good God be ever praised and glorified, for he has been pleased to let us reach this solemn day of his glorious resurrection. Let us sing Alleluia, which means praise the Lord. To sing it properly, we must strip our hearts of our old selves and put on our new self, which is Jesus Christ. To him let us sing forever. Alleluia, Alleluia. My friends, here are a few thoughts on prayer. Take time to pray. It is the greatest power on earth. And speaking of power... The greatest prayer is the sacrifice of the Mass. The second greatest prayer is the Holy Rosary. Many people don't think much of the Rosary, but they're missing an awful lot. Our Lady always listens when we pray the Rosary. She holds our hand as we pray the Rosary. It is very, very powerful. When you pray... Say what you mean, and mean what you say. Pray without ceasing. Have you ever tried to say the Jesus prayer? It's very easy. Jesus, 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 over and over during the day. God governs the world, but prayer governs God. Here's a little excerpt about the Divine Mercy, which we're going to talk about at great length next week. This is, these words are from Jesus. At three o'clock, implore my mercy, especially for sinners, and if only for a brief moment, steep yourself in my passion, particularly in my abandonment at the moment of agony. This, the three o'clock hour, is the hour of great mercy for the whole world. In this hour I will refuse nothing to the soul that makes a request of me in virtue of my passion. My Queen, my Mother, Blessed Mother, Mary, I give myself entirely to you. And to show my devotion to you, I consecrate to you today my eyes, my ears, my mouth, my heart, my whole being, without reserve. Therefore, good mother, as I am yours, keep me, guard me, as your property and possession. Amen. We're about out of time, my friends. Be sure to join us next week. Remember... We want to be with you. Y'all take care now. And God bless.